suspend. Let me do a refresh. And suspended proper, pro, uh, processes show up in gray. So what I do is just, just go suspend all these. Once they're all suspended and nobody can watch each other's back is then to kill them. Next topic of the session is rootkits. How many people have heard of rootkits? And I'm not surprised because rootkits have received a lot of attention in the media over the last few months. The, what we've got here is an escalation in the war of malware. Every, what I've shown you and what I've talked about, remediation techniques and investigation techniques, all apply to what I call well-behaved malware, believe it or not. Malware that to satisfy certain patterns is visible there for you to actually look at and investigate. But we're going to be entering this uh, era of a new class of malware, the malware that's stealthy, that you can't see, that is hiding. And that's what the, all those types of malware rely on is something called rootkit technology. Rootkits are not malware in and of themselves. They are a techn cloaking technology that gives the malware the ability to hide itself, kind of like the cloaking shields in Star Trek. There's actually already been a couple of viruses that have been really detected out in the wild that use rootkits. So the malware community is very well aware of this stuff. They're actively working on it, and they're leveraging this stuff for viruses, at least already, if not for adware and spyware. What's the history of rootkits? Well, they first appeared actually back in the 1980s. The, in fact, the fir one of the first known PC viruses called Brain was what's called, was called a DOS stealth virus. So kind of the first evidence of somebody wanting to clock, cloak malware. But the term rootkit appeared in the early 1990s because they first showed up on Unix systems in a, in a high profile way on SunOS where the malware authors would replace the core system utilities that let somebody investigate what's going on in the machine, like the PS command, which you use to, on a Unix system to see the list of running processes, and the LS utility, which you do use to do a directory listing. Those utilities would emit from their output the malware processes and the malware files. Modern rootkits have come a tremendous way since 1994. And modern rootkits can cloak everything from processes to services, TCP IP ports, files, registry keys, user accounts, and other things that I'm not even listing there. There are several major rootkit technologies that have evolved that are actually, actually being used. User mode API filtering, kernel mode API filtering, kernel mode data structure manipulation, and process hijacking. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to each one of those. If you want to go find sample code for these things, go to rootkit.com. The site, it's the meeting place for rootkit developers. Now, these are rootkit developers that say that they're doing work on behalf of the security community. Let's go talk about the way we can develop rootkits because their argument goes, if we are talking about it out in the open, the security community can look at what we're doing and come up with countermeasures. Of course, you know, the security community comes up with a countermeasure, then the root community comes back with something else. The first technique here, user mode API filtering. This attacks the APIs that an application looking at what's running on the system would use to see what's there. So let's take Task Manager as an example. It's going to be calling into a DLL that's loaded into this address space. That DLL provides an API that says, give me the list of processes running. That DLL calls into the kernel and gets back the list. So let's say the list is explorer.exe, malware.exe, and winlogon.exe. The rootkit living inside of Task Manager, which has hooked the call to get that list, filters the list on the way back to Task Manager, so Task Manager only sees Explorer and WinLogon. The cons of this approach are that you can bypass this by going to the kernel mode API directly and bypassing that rootkit that's sitting there in that DLL. But the pros are that you can infect an unprivileged account, something I'll talk more about later, but you don't have to be an admin to get infected with a rootkit like this. So even your users, your end users, can get malware on their machines that when they run Task Manager, they won't be able to see. Some examples of this type of rootkit are Hacker Defender and AFX. Both of these are up on rootkit.com. Kernel mode API filtering is the next level of sophistication. This is where the rootkit lives in kernel mode as a device driver, manipulating the core kernel APIs that Task Manager ultimately and other user mode programs ultimately depend on to get their view of the system. So here Task Manager calls an NTDLL, gets the list, the rootkit's down there in kernel, intercepting the list, modifying it, on the way back up, and now 
we've got an extremely thorough cloak. Even going to the kernel mode APIs directly, we're not able to see that rootkit, that malicious program there. The cons of this approach are that it requires admin privilege to install. You need to be an admin to install a device driver. It's also very difficult to write something like this and not crash the machine. But there's an example, of course, on rootkit.com of this called NT rootkit. And it was developed by the author of rootkit.com. The next level in sophistication is called kernel mode data structure manipulation, or, or direct kernel object ma manipulation, the rootkit community calls it. This is, instead of attacking the APIs and the results of the APIs, let's attack the data structures themselves. Because when task manager calls the API to query the list of running processes, the kernel simply traverses this list, which is the list of active processes. If the rootkit takes the malware process off that list, the root that processes threads will still execute. That piece of malware will still get a chance to use the CPU and run. However, the list of active processes will no longer include it, and now when task manager looks at the list, it's missing. Even if you call the core kernel APIs to look at the list, it's missing. Even if you look at the raw data structures, it's missing. The cons of this is it requires admin privilege to install a driver again. It can cause crashes. In fact, Microsoft has seen the prevalence of this kind of rootkit or this rootkit showing up now on customer machines because of crashes that come in to PSS. And when they look at the crashes, they see the fact that the crash occurred because this list was manipulated in an unsafe way that caused the machine to crash. There's also detection that's already been developed for this kind of attack. But the pros that more advanced ways of doing this are possible. And there's an example of this type of approach, too, on rootkit.com. It's called FU. Now, it took me a while. I was thinking, FU got to stand for something. And then suddenly it dawned on me. Now, the ultimate level of sophistication is really hiding, not in a process, not as a process at all, but inside of another process. Not even as a DLL, but just as a little piece of code sitting inside of some legitimate process like Explorer or a system process like LSAS, the Local Security Authority subsystem. Because all, the only way to find those kind of things are to be able to do entire memory scans looking for something that you know should be there or might be there. Otherwise, it doesn't show up in Task Manager. It doesn't show up in kernel mode data structures. It's totally invisible. And the con of this is it doesn't survive a reboot, because you kill that process and you've killed the malware. But the, it's just a matter of time before the malware authors are going to realize this is a great place to hide. And on the way, while the system is shutting down, save themselves to disk. When the system reboots, they load up into memory again and delete themselves off disk. So the only way to clean it then is to do a hard reboot. There's actually an example of this that's already been unleashed, and it's called Code Red. Yep, the Code Red virus that I mentioned earlier, when it injected itself into IIS, lived only in IIS's address space. It wasn't present on disk. If it wasn't for the fact that Code Red crashed IIS in a lot of situations and caused network problems, it probably wouldn't, might not have even been detected for a long time. So how do you detect these things? Well, all rootkits have some holes. They all leave some APIs unfiltered. They all have detectable side effects, even though in-memory stuff that hides. If you know what to look for, if you know to look for anomalies, you've got a pattern of what is uh, something that you expect to see, you can find these differences. Another one is that they can't cloak when the OS is offline. So you, once the OS is offline, right, the cloak is not active, and you can see the raw file system, the raw data structure. So rootkit detection, which is a, just a, a very immature area. It's evolving quickly, but this game has just started. And it, it is a game. It's a cat and mouse game, and I'll explain that in a minute. There are several examples of tools that attack these kinds of holes. One is called RT Detect. Another one's called F-Secure Blacklight from F-Secure. And at SysInternals, Bryce and I have released one called Rootkit Revealer. The simple way of doing rootkit detection without any tool at all is simply to compare a directory listing of your, and registry tra uh, trace of your system online and compare that with offline. So uh, offline OS, for example, would be WinPE, ERD Commander, or BART PE. You're booting the machine clean off a CD. You do a dir slash s slash ah into some output file. You do the same thing when you're online. Now you've got those two listings, and then you win diff them. Discrepancies are going to show up because as the system is shutting down from an online state, it's going to be changing 
temporary files and deleting files and creating some new files.